All right. Okay. Shall we start? Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Mikhail Mironov, and here is Mike Schmidt. We work for AMD, and I'm architect and lead developer for Liquid VR and some other SDKs. And Mike is director and our guru for stitching. Yes, so, Project Loom Video Stitching. Yes. So today's presentation will, will be divided into parts. First, I will say about some internals and our best practices to using Liquid VR, and then Mike will present his Loom real-time video stitching project. Yes. Okay. We'll see you okay. in 30 minutes. We're excited. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and let's start. Okay. So what we will talk today about uh, Liquid VR. First of all, we will share our results of integration into game engines. We are very excited. We integrated our multi-GPU feature into, game, into two main game engines, and we will share your results. We will talk about a little bit about hardware requirements. We would like that you guys start using multi-GPU as fast as you can, and there are a few small details which may be not work if you don't pay attention to, detail, to the hardware details. We will talk how Affinity Multi-GPU works in details. We will talk a little bit about device shim and what does it mean to work between, uh, how, how kind of Multi-GPU works together with Direct3D. And we'll talk about game engine integration details, and let's start. So first of all, why, do we, why we are talking about multi-GPU and GPU affinity? As you know, VR application, we hear whole, whole three, days, three days about performance and latency. And VR applications are more demanding than regular application, regular games. Why? You need to render two eyes. And to, uh, to render two eyes, there are slightly different angles, and there is just no way you can repeat this thing. So you need to render two views for left eye and right eye. And here, our multi-GPU feature and second GPU can help. It can render, you can spread the job between first GPU and second GPU for each eye, then combine things together and present on the screen. So you can improve performance dramatically. There are two ways to do it, several ways to do it, and we will talk a little bit about different ways. But in essence, you can uh, the best thing to do broadcast API or 3D commands, commands to GPU in one call, and driver will do the rest. And you can take care about synchronization, and we'll talk about synchronization details. And the best thing is uh, the API and this feature is not limited by two GPUs. Potentially, you can have more. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what kind of hardware you need to do more than two GPUs. So first of all, most important thing is results. We integrated multi-GPU feature in all possible versions of Unreal Game Engine. And we have very good performance gains from this integration. We did the same thing for Unity. Uh, you shouldn't compare numbers between game engines. We are not in the business of comparing game engines and performance of game engines. What we wanted to show, single GPU versus multiple GPU. Obviously, results depend on content. If your content is not GPU bound, I mean, you don't care, right? You, it just works. But all games want to more GPU, more details, more pixels. So with that, we see you, you can see that from 80 per, 8, 70, 80% of the gains you can get from multi with proper GPU scaling. Keep in mind that uh, on, let's say, Unreal, in multi-GPU you always see 90 frames per second. Why? Because it's limited by Oculus. Oculus will pace the game engine to 90 frames per second so you cannot get more. It's just a limitation, which is good. That's what we wanted to achieve to reach Oculus pace 90 frames per second. Let's talk about uh, a little bit about hardware requirements. First of all, CPU. To achieve good results, you need to be GPU bound. If your CPU is too slow, whatever GPU you have, 
you will not you will be bound by CPU. So we have uh, a few few recommendations. First, check your memory. You should fill in all banks on uh, on motherboard. Then that will give you at least dual memory channels. Check this. Check your motherboards and processors. There are a few recommendations here. They are not comprehensive, but before doing seriously trying multi-GPU, ensure that your hardware meet some uh, necessary requirements. How to check? Our Radeon settings has few helpers for you, for you. First of all, you can go to system. You can check your current PCI Express connection. You can see right now it's 16 x16, which means maximum speed. You need to check both GPUs. As you can see, there are two GPUs on the top. And second thing is to check is linked. Your GPU for multi-GPU feature it needs to be switched on in linked mode. And here is indicator. If not, don't worry. You can go to our game settings, then global settings, and switch on Crossfire, which is another name for linked mode. So once you switch this, you are ready to start multi-GPU. Uh, a few words about hardware requirements. Obviously, you need either two or more our latest GPU boards, or you can try Radeon Pro Duo, which will have two GPUs on a single board. It will, it will ease your motherboard requirements, uh, but it's obviously more expensive. A link mode also known as crossfire mode. There are two modes where operation system connects to GPUs. One is a normal mode where two GPUs are visible for applications. You can select adapter on, for DX API and then uh, use one of them. Or linked mode where applications see just one adapter, but underneath our driver will allow, will do some magic and will allow you use two GPUs. And originally, uh, initially, multi-GPU, two GPUs were designed uh, for AFR mode, alternated frame rate mode, where each GPU render each, uh, uh, render each frame and then frames are combined and presented. But the problem with this original design was that there is a latency. When you render two frames on each GPU, you, you, you may double frame rate, but you will not be able to, achieve, to reduce latency. And multi-GPU mode for VR, when you render each eye on each GPU, will increase your latency dramatically. So let's uh, look into multi-GPU feature from application perspective. Obviously, you need to render two eyes from different, we, we spoke about this many, many times. If you have single GPU, here is what your timeline would look like. You draw one eye, left eye, then you draw right eye, you do some warping, or not you, maybe HMD will do probably your warping, and then there is a presentation. But if you have two GPUs, you can spread the job between two GPUs. There is additional part, which is transfer from the GPU number one to GPU number zero, so you can present everything together because presentation happened on the zero GPU. You need to synchronize between two GPUs, and we'll talk about details of the synchronization. And then you have, in the end, you have nice gain. Your gain very depend on your content. If you con you have a GPU, you have a lot of in lot and draw more you more heavy content, more gain you have. So let's talk a little bit about internals. How uh, software stack look like. For single GPU, it's pretty straightforward. Application calls uh, D3D11 runtime, runtime call AMD DXX with the name DXX driver, uh, and then we call kernel driver, and then everything goes to hardware. So calls go straightforward, nothing fancy. But for multi-GPU, it's slightly different. We have driver, but this driver will have two instances of DXX running on separate threads. That allows us to broadcast commands to both GPUs simultaneously, and this is kind of a master. And when you want to change GPU or application want to drive which GPU to use for particular command, you use masks. 
for mask number one for, it goes to the first GPU, mask number two goes to the second GPU, or you can set mask to three using API above, uh, and then the command will go to two GPUs simultaneously. So it will look like this. When mask is one, command uh, just CFX, crossfire driver, redirects calls to the first GPU. If mask is two, uh, crossfire driver will redirect calls to the second GPU, and you can broadcast it to the two GPUs. Pretty cool. Let's see what's happened in timeline. First, any game engine need to do some CPU job. Not much we can do about that. Then engine will do some eye specific and submit some jobs to GPU. And then for another eye. Then there is something common like draw calls. When you do draw call, you pass the same objects uh, to the application. So these calls can be broadcasted. And then there is a transfer, synchronization, and the second frame starts. So this is typical, most optimal timeline for multi-GPU use case. But sometimes application is not just capable to split the job and make uh, this part is going to left eye, this part going to the right eye, and then the rest is common. Sometimes engines are not structured for that, and we found this in Unreal Game Engine. In this case, uh, in a sense, it's more simplified. So there is, again, engine work, there is submission for right eye, and there is submission for left eye. But, and then application submit transfer, but there is a gap, and there is a weight here, which uh, goes in the, uh, from the fact that left eye submitted much late compared to the right eye, and there is, uh, if we can, we can avoid this. If not, I mean, it will still work, it will still give better results, but we should be aware about these two modes of submission. And then there is a second uh, frame rendering. Now, let's go a little bit to the code. You saw me uh, several times I put semaphore. Semaphore is your G GPU, this is GPU semaphore. This is not traditional operation system semaphore. It allows you to synchronize jobs between GPUs. Let's put some details, and this is very important when you do the transfer. You don't want to override things. So first thing, you need to create a semaphore. And let's assume your application do some simple drawing. So you set mask to the left and draw left eye. Then you set mask to the right, to the second GPU, and draw to the right eye. And now you need to transfer. You need to submit transfer. So Liquid VR API has transfer X extension. There are many parameters, but there are two important parameters here. First one, source. This is, in this case, it's index, not the mask. So source will be the second GPU, or, and destination will be zero, so zero GPU. So we transfer from GPU two to GPU one, but, Interestingly enough, now we need to synchronize. We started this transfer, we need to ensure that GPU, first GPU where a presentation happened, should wait until transfer is complete. For that, we use this semaphore. So we first submit a signal to GPU one, uh, to GPU one, to the second GPU, and then we submit work for wait to the GPU zero, which need to wait until GPU one is done. So let's, uh, so th that's two numbers are important. Pretty simple, but still need to do it right. Let's see in timeline how it would look like. So you draw right eye, you draw left eye, you submit the transfer, and then you queue submission to the first GPU. So when GPU one will reach uh, the semaphore, it will signal, right? So we submit, this job to wait job to the GPU zero, so it will tell, wait for the first GPU. So at this point, GPU are synchronized and we can do time warp and present. And the second frame will repeat things. Few words about GPU. In main reason why we have uh, GPU semaphores to synchronize between two different GPUs, but they also useful when you want to synchronize between 
different queues. IMD hardware has two queues, 3D queue and compute queue. And on compute queue, we use asynchronous compute, which is mostly used by HMDs. But if you need to synchronize between two queues and don't wait on CPU, semaphores are your friends. Uh, in other details, uh, semaphores can no, uh, must be signaled before waited, so order when you submit these jobs to GPU is important. And please don't reuse semaphore because before wait is complete. They are not re-entrants, so it's better to create a pool of semaphores, depend how far you submit your frames, and reuse semaphores from a pool. Fences. Again, GPU fences and the code that I put in the slide probably familiar from all DX developers. You submit a query, a D3D11 query, and then you end it, and then you wait for query. But the problem, with, and the idea here is to synchronize. To CPU waits until GPU is empty. It's, clear, it's complete all jobs. But the problem with this is it burns CPU. And not much you can do. You can create, insert some sleeping inside, but then you will not be as precise as you would like to be. So for that, Liquid VR provides fences. So obviously you need to create a fence, then you execute your draw, and then you submit your fence to GPU. And then you wait on the fence. In reality, under the hood is just a normal Windows event. So you will not burn any CPU, and CPU can be used for something else if you need this thing. And then frame continues. A uh, little bit different topic. When you start to work with multi-GPU, we require that application use a liquid VR shim. Shim is implementation of DX11 interfaces, which I pointed here. And as soon as application created DX11 device, it should pass it to Liquid VR, get back pointer with the shim, and use it as a D3D11 device. Why? Unfortunately, D3D11 runtime is not aware about multi-GPU. It has no idea that some jobs go to the left, to one GPU, some jobs go to the another GPU. Imagine you have a buffer and you want to you set your affinity to GPU 1, you set constant buffer, so you bound your buffer to the vertex shader, and then you set render affinity to 2, and eventually you bound the same buffer to the another shader, uh, to, to the same shader, but on another GPU. Guess what? The second call will not go through up to the driver. Why? Because in DX3D11 runtime, they will check, oh, you already bound this pointer. Why bother? Why send commands to the GPU? So it will not go through. That's a problem. So this is why we have this shim. So shim will do some magic around D3D11 runtime and allows all calls to go through regardless of Microsoft runtime optimization. So please don't forget, the shim is your friend, and without that, most of multi-GPU work will not happen. A game integration details. As I said, we integrated multi-GPU in both game engines. And just wanted to share how integration would look like. It's pretty simple. In Unreal, you will see some loop by views, so by eyes. So you will have left eye, view is an eye. Left eye, right eye, and then you do some processing. So integration would look very simple. We will set mask depend on I with some logic inside. And in case multi-GPU is not available, this additions will just do nothing. It will skip. So you will safely can run the same code on two GPU, on single GPU system. So uh, the process function will be submitted to the first GPU, to the second GPU with maybe different parameters, and then mask just as percussion will go to both. But we found several optimizations in game engine which are not designed for multi-GPU. Imagine set blend state. So uh, the game engine will check, oh, if this state is already set, we don't need to bother. We will optimize and we will not set it. But guess what? If this function is executed for first GPU 
and will not be executed for the second GPU, then one GPU will not get the right state. So it will not work for the I. In this particular case, situation is simple. Unreal will give us a flag, and we can just disable state, uh, state caching, right? But there are other cases when there is no such flag. Imagine there is optimization like this. There is a loop by eyes, we draw something, and uh, then we fill in some texture. And if texture is filled in, we will do nothing. It looks fine, it's optimization, so you do the job for first eye and you use it for the second eye. Everything is fine, but imagine we inserted affinity mask. So we send this command draw to the first GPU and then to second GPU. But this optimization will not work for the second GPU. And here's what will happen in time. So we will draw to, te so for single GPU, everything is fine. You draw to first uh, texture, use it to draw left eye, draw right eye, everything is good. But for, uh, for multi-GPU case, we will draw on the first GPU, use it, everything is fine. But for the second GPU, the texture corresponding, uh, the first corresponding, corresponding texture on, and video memory and GPU will not be filled in. So you will have corruption of artifacts in your right eye. How we can get around this issue? Pretty simple, we just find these places and force this fill-in texture to ex be executed on two GPUs. There, are, there is an alternative, you can execute it on one GPU and then transfer result uh, to the, another GPU, but it requires more coding. So with that, what will happen under the draw for in to the texture, fill in texture, will be executed under mask three. So this means it will be repeated the same thing on two GPUs. And then once you draw left and right scene, it will be used properly and you will get the right results. Okay. So here's our main tool is GPU view. Here are the actual results from first part is single GPU for the same content, the same scene, where ex uh, rendering for one frame takes about 22 milliseconds. And once we apply it multi-GPU exactly for the same scene, the same binaries, uh, the rendering goes uh, to 12 milliseconds, which is about uh, uh, 90 frames per second. And you can see uh, at, in the compute queue, interesting detail here, in compute queue, you see small ticks. This is uh, asynchronous time warp that are run by Oculus. And you can see the frequency. And call for action. First of all, check our Liquid VR on GPU Open and GitHub. Request patches from us. We're working with game engines to integrate multi-GPU into engines themselves, but for now, request patches from us. It's, they're not huge and very, they are very easy to integrate or apply if you use customized game engine. If you have custom engine that is not Unreal or Unity, try to integrate multi-GPU, contact us, and stay tuned for new features. And with that, I will give the mic to Mike. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Mikhail. Is my mic on? Good. Okay, I'm Mike Schmidt. Uh, I'm going to talk about Project Loom. So this is the agenda. I'm going to talk about what's uh, the major features, uh, what makes stitching hard, and to sort of walk through a quick example. So if you don't know exactly how stitching works, you'll at least have a sort of good idea of uh, the idea of what it works. I'll talk about some of the problems, system requirements, and at the end I'll tell you about the performance. So we're introducing, it's a whole new way actually of doing stitching. We're, the, the target is to be in real time. Uh, we're going to open source all this within the next couple of weeks so everyone will be able to get it. So if you're watching this uh, on the internet, you should be able to look for it uh, soon. Uh, it's based on uh, OpenVX. So OpenVX is a Chrono standard that's about two years old for computer vision. And this pipeline allows us to really accelerate the processing and it accelerates the development process as well 
And so in today's talk, I don't have a lot of time to talk about uh, Kronos' OpenVX, but that's something that you can go and check out. So from the ground up, we built this with massive parallelism in, uh, as the basic idea. It's also an option, but if you're doing real time, it's not an option. You want real time data acquisition. So we built in a way to do that. Uh, you can also use it to just do fast offline stitching where you don't do real time capture, like you're just uh, stitching from files. We have also have the option, especially if you're stitching from files, to integrate hardware uh, decoder and encoders. And you can also, as a third party developer, add in your own algorithms into the pipeline and it's really easy to do. We actually built a debugging tool that you get with this that's a scripting language and you can literally write a stitching pipeline in about two dozen lines of scripting language and you can add and remove items uh, from that that you build yourself. So we, in summary, we've gone from this sort of meandering road of, you know, you're stitching at a leisurely pace to where we've built this super highway uh, for stitching and you can put your own fast vehicles on that highway. All right. So like I say, we're optimized for GPU. Uh, we stitch up to 16K by 8K uh, echo rectangular format. In the first release, it's limited to 8K by 4K. Uh, there's one change we have to make to bump it up, but currently everyone's down in the 4K range anyway for most deliveries, so that shouldn't be a problem. We can handle up to 31 cameras being stitched uh, with five overlaps for each pixel. So in other words, five cameras can overlap in one pixel. That's a limitation of some of the data structures. It's not a limitation of sort of the concept of how we built this. Uh, you can insert virtual cameras, so you might want to put a camera over where the tripod goes, or you might want to stick a company logo, or you might want to put something up at the North Pole, you know, some uh, name of the project or whatever you're doing, uh, depending on what your camera rig looks like. Uh, you can also do things like uh, watermark in, uh, advertisements or other text that you might want to stick in. The initial release is, uh, is mono, so we're going really fast with mono. Next, after this, we'll be working on 3D stereo. So let's talk a little bit about why stitching is so hard. Okay, there's four basic things that, uh, they're probably the things that are the most difficult about stitching, and number one is parallax. Uh, everyone knows parallax, right? You can put up your fingers and you can, you can see that your eyes see different things. I'm going to uh, show a slide on that later. Uh, the second thing is the number of cameras or number of lenses that you have in your camera rig versus the number of sims. So this is one of these things where the more cameras, the more lenses that you have, the better because you get better you can actually get better camera technology and better lenses in general because if you have a small number of cameras, you're going to have a giant uh, fisheye lens. And although that makes it really convenient to have a small camera, you get more distortion. And even though you can correct some of the distortion, you're still fighting a losing battle. You're losing uh, pixel density there. So the problem is the more lenses that you have, that means the more seams that you have to stitch and the more chance you have for artifacts. So it's sort of like, you know, uh, a double-edged sword. Exposure variances. So what happens is each camera that you have in your rig is going to have its own uh, exposure that it's uh, either automatically doing or what you've set it to. And it doesn't matter what you do, like even right here in this room, I've got a bright light in front of me and over on the side over here, it's dark. So if you're doing a 360 view of this, this camera is going to be basically have a white balance problem because it's staring right at a lens. And over here, I'm in some dark area and it's going to be, going to be dark. So in order to stitch the seam in between there, you have to actually do some balancing of those di different uh, light sources. And the fourth thing is synchronization. So there's two synchronization issues that you have to worry about. One of them is synchronizing the audio to all the cameras. And uh, 
there's, there's several ways that you can deal with that. And in most uh, cinematic type of productions, you're going to have professional audio people and you're going to be doing post-production where you actually do all that. But in live, in real time, you sort of don't have a chance to do that. So you've got to have a way to actually capture audio and video and keep them in sync. So there's a second synchronization problem, and that is synchronization between the cameras. So most cameras uh, that are, say, on a cell phone, they all use what's called rolling shutter, right? And so rolling shutter is basically it scans a line and then it goes to the next one and the next one. By the time you get to the bottom of your frame, it's a long time lag since you took the first pixel up in the upper left corner of your camera. In the more costly camera rigs, you're going to use cameras that have what's called global shutter. And global shutter is going to take the entire picture at the same time. Now, still, this is separate from the idea of you actually have multiple cameras and that you still have to figure out a way to synchronize the cameras. So if they're rolling shutter, they're all going to be at different places at different times. Uh, but still, you can actually do what's called genlock, and that's where you send a synchronization signal to each camera, and they all start at the same time. OK, so this is what the whole software stack looks like. But before I actually dive into this, let me just sort of back up a little bit and tell you a little bit about why we call this Project Loom. So if you know, a loom is something that weaves fabric. And the obvious thing that came to our minds was, well, we have thousands of threads on the GPU that are doing the processing. And looms weave fabric with thousands of threads. But when I actually looked into the invention of the loom, and if you Google this, uh, you'll find a, a Wikipedia article about Joseph Jacquard, who is credited with having invented the loom. And most looms today are still called the Jacquard loom. But it turns out he didn't actually invent the loom. Matter of fact, when he was a kid, he worked on a loom. And he was what was called a draw boy. And a draw boy in uh, a loom is the, they were, they were boys because they actually they climb up on top and they needed to be lightweight and they needed to have small fingers to get into the threads and manipulate uh, the different patterns that they were doing. And he swore that this was a terrible job and that he was going to try to get rid of it. And so he actually figured out how to use punch cards to control the whole process and automate the whole thing. And this was basically the beginning of computer programming languages. And Babbage later used this idea in his, his uh, computer that he built or tried to build. So what happened was, because of that, the productivity of the fabric weaving uh, in, in France, where this was developed, went from a couple of square inches per day, right? That's what it took back then to weave fine silks, to a couple of square yards per day. And so what did the master weavers do with all their new spare time was they came up with new colors, new patterns, and they basically changed the industry from being creating fabric to creating fashion because they had to actually go market their new products all the time to the world. And so this is what we hope to do with Loom, is to basically get rid of some of the drudgery of creating 360 video and unleash that creativity in the uh, marketplace. So now onto this software stack. You can see these dark green parts are the parts that are Project Loom. And you can see where you write your application. You can write plugins. Uh, there's that middle layer where we built these stitching kernels that are uh, OpenVX components. And you can see those dark blue parts are the uh, parts of the drivers that AMD already has supplied. So this is what the, the goal is of uh, stitching, is you're trying to take and create this equirectangular format. There's other formats as well. And then after you've stitched that into that rectangular format, the headset is going to actually take that and warp it into a, the sphere that you're going to see. So you can see that in the equirectangular format, things are distorted, right? A circle doesn't exactly look like a circle except right on the equator. So this is what the pipeline looks like. Now, this is a simplification. There's actually more steps in this. But essentially, this is for offline stitching. And there's a, another slide right here that shows what the real time looks like. So in the real time case, 
You have a Genlock signal that goes to all your cameras. Your cameras can be, uh, for example, HDMI or SDI, or you can take HDMI and convert it to SDI. You capture those into the PC, and then you go through those blue steps of actually doing the stitching, and then you output it uh, through another PC, or you can stream it. So I'm going to talk about, in the rest of the talk, is mostly those blue boxes of the different stages that you actually go through. So the first step is uh, color space conversion. So your camera uh, is normally going to give you some kind of a YUV uh, kind of data type. You're going to convert that into RGB. You're going to do a lens correction, which I'll talk about in a minute. You're gonna, then going to take each one of those cameras and warp them into an equirectangular space, each one per camera. And then you're going to take and do some steps to find seams and uh, blend them together and essentially collapse all those into one image. And then that one image, you're going to possibly color space convert it at the end and then sen uh, send it out or record it to a file. So this is what your PC might look like. You have many cameras. You have all these uh, cameras being captured into the PC. And in our professional workstation graphics, we have a feature called Direct GMA, which allows a capture card to take the data that comes in from the uh, cameras and dump it directly into the GPU memory. And this is one of the ways that we get some extra performance is we're not wasting bandwidth copying all the pixels around several times. So inside the GPU, we're then going to stitch it and then uh, send it back out. Uh, this is another uh, configuration that you might use. There might be a separate PC that's uh, separate that you're going to actually view it on. And as a matter of fact, you can take the SDI signal and you can split it and send it to many different PCs. So you could have, you could be shooting a movie, you could have several people all have their own PC, all with their headset, all watching what's going on. And this is another configuration, same idea, but you're outputting to another PC, and that PC is then going to stream it onto the internet. Another alternative configuration is you can split the SDI signals that are coming into the PC, send them to different PCs, and each PC could stitch separately. So, and then from there, you can do the same things as, as before. And the reason for that is you may want to stitch one at 1080p, one at 4K, one at 6K. You could archive one. You could stream one. You could be using one for viewing. OK, so I talked a little bit about OpenVX before. The idea of OpenVX, uh, this diagram here is not stitching. This is just a generic OpenVX uh, graph. In the OpenVX terminology, you build graphs and a runtime engine, which is part of our driver uh, that's already been open sourced, actually takes the pipeline that you describe to it and before it actually starts processing, it runs some optimizations on it and figures out the best way to execute it on your hardware, either based on the hints that you give it or based on what it just knows about the system. Okay, so let's look at the actual stitching pipeline. The first thing is you're going to do lens correction. Uh, these are some examples of how images might look in various uh, different kinds of lenses, different kinds of uh, distortions, and the bottom right is, is the corrected image. We support uh, in Loom uh, several different lens types like regular rectilinear lenses, fisheye lenses, circular fisheye lenses, uh, there's a couple of different models for how you describe the distortion that we support. And if you actually have some special lens that's even different, you can just plug in that at the beginning of the pipeline and replace what we have. So this is sort of a good visual example. You're taking several cameras. So just three are shown here just uh, as an example. Uh, those lenses have some distortion to them. You then correct that distortion. And then you take each one of those and you warp it into its own equirectangular space. The shapes that are being shown there are not uh, precise. And then you take all of those different equirectangular images and you just collapse them down into one and you're done. Now, of course, if you do that, you're not going to get an actual good result. And this is really the whole trick 
to stitch in, or the, you know, the, the part that everyone spends a lot of the time on, is that there's all these areas of overlap, right? So you either have to pre-decide which camera you're going to take the image from, and we have an option to do that, which is really fast. But what you're really going to want to do is actually look at that overlap area and f find a seam in it. But before you can find the seam, you actually need to uh, balance the exposure of those different images. So I've converted it to black and white here, and you can see I've exaggerated it uh, you know, for illustrative purposes. You can see that they're, they're all different exposures. They all have something different. And you basically have to equalize out the exposure so that you can look in those overlap areas and make an uh, honest comparison of where you want to make the, the seam. So what you're going to do is do some kind of an algorithm that finds the seam. Now, there's been you know, thousands of papers written on how you do this. Uh, there's lots of different algorithms out there. We took one, there's one of the most popular is one called graph cut, there's, there's several others. We did sort of a modification of the graph cut that was uh, e more easy to parallelize on the GPU so that we can run, uh, we, we, what we basically do is we take all possible paths through each overlap area and score each one and then find the one that has the best score and use that with some modifications which I'll get to in a second. So the idea there is you're, before you actually go to find the seam, you have some kind of a cost metric that you calculate for every pixel. And then as you go through and you find your seam, you actually come up with the one that has the least cost, and then that's the winner at the end. Hello? Is there someone talking here? The next room, yeah. <laughs> Okay, if you're on the internet, there's some guy in the next room, and, and ignore that. They'll probably edit that out anyway. So what we're doing is we're finding the best seam, but then the problem happens in the next frame. So if you go on the next frame, and you immediately start trying to find the least cost, it might change. And if your seam moves back and forth, then you're going to notice something in the, in the video because you're going to see something that's shimmering or, or moving back and forth. So we basically built in a hysteresis that stabilizes this that you can control, that once you pick a seam, it sort of sticks with it for some amount of time. And the way that you can override that is the time period expires, or we have another algorithm that basically looks at each overlap area on every frame, and it gives it a score on how much stuff is changing in that scene compared to a previous time. And if enough stuff is changed, it basically cues that seam up to, cues that overlap area up to have a new seam computed. And then once you do that, then there's like another time period that you have to go before you can do it. So basically somebody's walking into a seam, you're going to immediately, at some point, you're going to pass the threshold of you, enough stuff has changed. But then on the next frame, it's going to change again and again. So once you get that trigger, it's going to calculate a new seam and then stick with it for some shorter amount of time. And then if it motion continues, it'll keep triggering it. Again, all those are things that you can modify or control with parameters. OK, so even though you've picked a seam, there's still the idea of there's some uh, region that you're going to want to blend across to actually merge those together. So if the seam was really hard, for example, like the edge of this podium, right, and you're going to pick that as a seam, you might want to say, well, that's a really strong seam. I don't really want to blend this side and this side together because you'll end up sort of seeing some fuzziness or, or something else. So in that case, you might blend a very narrow region. But if you've got cameras that are up in the sky, and it's uh, hazy blue, and you're uh, trying to do some overlap, you're going to want to blend over a wider range because you're going to be able to notice that seam. So this is what you want to actually get, something where the seam just is completely invisible and goes away. Uh, I'm going to show that in a second, but before I get there, 
uh, I'm going to talk about this parallax problem. Because once you pick a seam, depending on which camera it's coming from, you're going to see a, any particular object to at least two different ways. So this is a top view of a camera rig with just two cameras being shown. You can see that star is an object out there. And if you look at it from those two different camera points of view, one is going to see a star with a green background, and the other one is going to see a star with a red background. And this is the reason why you have to keep your seam stable, because otherwise you'll be flipping back and forth, and you'll be seeing an object with a different background constantly. So in this slide, you can see we've blended together two images, and there's a seam. And if you notice, about one-third of the way from the left-hand edge, you can actually see the edge of the sky where the two images came together. So the image on the right was slightly overexposed, and the sky is much lighter blue, and the one on the left is slightly underexposed, and it's much darker. So the goal is to actually blend it like this, where the seam completely disappears, and you've balanced out the exposures. So this is a really quick step through of how that works. And we're using an algorithm which is called multiband blending. And in this case, you actually build what's called a Laplacian pyramid of the pixels of the image. And the pyramid goes from the bottom, which is uh, what's high frequency information, and to the top of the pyramid, which is low frequency. And you can have as many bands as you want in theory. We've built it to run anywhere between two and six bands. Four bands is pretty much sort of the normal that you would probably want to use. And if you're not really familiar with video codecs and information and what is high frequency and low frequency information, on the right is a completely new image where the block A is what is considered low frequency. There's not anything that's changing that quick. It's just open blue sky. And in Area B on that image is what we will call high frequency information. The things that think, there's lots of stuff happening across there. So if you blend the B part over a wide range, what's going to happen is you're just going to fuzz up the image and it's going to look blurry. And you're going to know that there was a seam there because there's a big fuzzy line. All right. So what happens is, is you're going to take those low frequency areas and blend them over a wide area, and you're going to take the high frequency and blend it over a smaller area, so you're not going to see that fuzziness. And so this is sort of a, a step through of what that looks like. So between the red lines is the overlap area. You can see there's a discontinuity between the left and the right because they have different exposures. I'm going to pick a seam, which is right there with that line. And that's what it would look like if both cameras were perfectly in balance with each other and there was, everything was perfectly aligned, which is what you're not going to normally ever get. But the goal is to get to that. So this is what it really looks like. There's some discontinuity there. And so you're going to basically just stitch them together, which is essentially drawing that line between them. But you're still going to be able to see the fact that there's some problem there. Now, you can see in the high frequency on the top, the discontinuity is the same amount, but it's much more obvious. And in the high frequency, you probably don't notice it quite as much. Now, remember, each band that you're going to, I'm only showing two bands here, but you're normally going to do this for two to six bands. And the difference between the high frequency and the low frequency here in the, this cartoony picture I drew is just some, some numbers. But each band that you're going to do in this Laplacian pyramid is going to be a factor of two from each other. So if you had four bands, you're basically getting a factor of 16 difference in uh, the frequencies that you're doing. And that essentially controls how many pixels wide you're blending. So you're going to be blending, say, two pixels as opposed to 32 pixels in, in that range. So essentially, that area is the, uh, is the blend, blend area. You can see in the top, I've shown that I'm going to blend it over a wide range. And if I blend it over that, you would probably not notice it as much. And in the high frequency, I'm going to blend it over a narrow range. 
Okay, so that sort of ends the description of how the pipeline works. Um, there's more to it, and you'll be able to see that when you uh, look at the code. Uh, now I'm just going to sort of end with some of the speeds and feeds, and then we'll take questions and answers. So on inputs, we can take in one PC, uh, we can input either 1080p or 4K images from cameras. We can take those in at 24, or 30, 60 frames per second. We can have a max of 31 of these. It's going to be difficult to actually build a PC that actually does that, and I'll get that to that in just a second. Uh, we can take compressed data formats for offline. Uh, we can take uncompressed NYUV 422. Uh, it can be 10-bit or 8-bit. And you can insert into the stream virtual cameras to backfill where you don't actually have a camera or you want to cover up where there's a tripod or something else in the scene that you don't want people to see. These can be like bitmaps or JPEGs or anything like that. On the camera inputs, in order to get cameras into your PC in real time, you're going to need some kind of a SDI capture card or some other method to get the data in. Uh, currently on the market that we know of, the capture card that, that has the most inputs is eight, capture, eight streams at a time at 1080p. So you can put two of those easily into a PC. You can put three of them into a PC and get uh, 24 inputs, and you still need a PCIe slot for your graphics card. And that basically maxes out most motherboards in the market. So if you're going to go beyond that, because you might want to send the data out over SDI, you're going to need a box that's like a PCI extender. So you can actually get another box that has more slots in it that you then connect into your one slot in your regular PC, if you're going for more than, say, uh, 12 or, or if you're going for more than, say, 16 cameras in your rig. Okay, for uh, outputs, so you've stitched your image and now you want to output it. Uh, if it's offline, it's just a file, right? So we can output, it says on here, 4K by 2K at 60 frames per second. Okay, we can actually do higher than this. We can actually output in real time, say up to 6K by 3K. You still need to find an encoder that can go that fast on your PC. <laughs> so in our hardware, we only support encoding with our hardware encoder up to 4K. But you could output it to another PC that's dedicated to actually doing that encode. For real-time output, the highest you can go is 4K, because that's the highest that you can get some kind of a SDI output card to actually output. And we can output at 24, 30, or 60 frames per second. Uh, 